Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another episode of Book Review. Today, we're going to be talking about this book title called Applying Math with Python. So, right off the bat, I thought it was pretty cool to share with you guys what I've learned about this book, and it's super amazing, right? Before we dive into neural network and start building all that fancy AI stuff, we really need to understand where the math comes from. And I know last episode we talked about simulation. In this episode, we're really diving into the math component. Now, people might get confused, right? We're talking about math. What is the whole point of coding? What is the whole point of Python? I can simply use a pen, pencil, draw some equations, do some derivations, and if I follow the rules, I'll get the answer correct, then the job is done. I would say, from a fundamental perspective, that's definitely a fair question to bring up. Now, the caveat is, at today's world, that is no longer sufficient anymore. Because all that mathematical stuff, if you only land on paper, and you don't practice with code, you won't be able to see how effective in the world that math is doing to the model. And you won't be able to see the impact and the potential the math is doing to the real world model. And that's a problem, right? It's a problem for two reasons. A, in real world, there are lots of diverse resources of whatever data is coming in, and chances are you may or may not know the data assumption. And if you just blindly throw math at it, if it works, if it doesn't work, you don't know. Because your math is only on paper, you haven't practiced in real world. Second reason is bug check, right? In real world, we can just deploy some AI model to a facility, an organization, or a group of customers, and then we're like, hey, fingers crossed, whatever the AI says, we're going to do it to you, right? We're going to give you chemotherapy, we're going to put you under, whatever. That won't work, and it will never work. In real world, we really need to come back to check, okay, what is going on, and specifically, what is the explainability of that AI model? And guess what? Where does that come from? It comes from mathematical understanding. Because mathematical understanding in real world is no longer derivation on paper, it's a set of rules that we agreed upon, that we follow, that create that result. And it's our job as data scientists to understand that. So hopefully this gives you a motivation of what this book is about before I start a review of the content. And that's why I think this book plays a very important role in our day-to-day -day life as a data scientist. All right, so that's a lot of common about the motivation of this book which I really enjoy. Let's come back to the book review. First thing I'm gonna say is the author. So the name of the author for this title is Sam Morley. And Sam, you've done an amazing job at writing this book. Let me tell you, the amount of technical details going inside this book trumped two or three years of experience in grad school. And me personally, I really enjoy learning that. Because when I was in grad school, everything was on paper. And I really didn't get a chance to practice what I have done on paper in computer. So it's safe to say that this book gets that job done. And I take a look of the profile of this author. He's a research software engineer and a mathematician from University of Oxford. And then on top of that, he's the guy to work on the data sick project at Oxford University, which I thought it's an interesting thing to bring up. Because to be honest, before I read this title, I actually haven't heard of anything called DataSig. I don't know what it's about. So I went online and did some research and it turned out that it's the AI program under University of Oxford, backed by the university, get its funding, and it's doing a wide range of activities. So it has research, both going to industry as well as publication. Some of these leading papers are actually going to New Rips, which is the highest ranked AI conference out there. And then they also do a wide range of educational programs for students both inside of the University of Oxford and external to the world. So it's a pool of amazing resources got put together, backed by University of Oxford, and it's extremely wonderful to see someone from that prestigious level is willing to write his book and share what he knows about AI with all of us. So here's also a message for Sam. If you're watching this video, I really appreciate the amount of effort that you put in writing this book. So with that being said, let's take a look at high-level review of this title. And as a disclaimer, this video is in joint collaboration with Pack Publisher. And if you haven't heard about it, how that works is whenever there's a new release of a title, 
they will send me a book and I will review the book, review the code, and I will give an honest opinion. Outside of that, there isn't really any other monetary incentive, so hopefully the content of this video is providing you the unbiased feedback of my take and my personal experience after I review these titles. So the first thing I want to say about this book is that it's a math book. But unlike all the other math textbooks out there that you're going to learn, linear algebra, calculus, whatever, in undergraduate program, this title focuses on the coding aspect. As a comparison to calculus or linear algebra, they will introduce the theorem, introduce the formula, and you get to do a lot of exercises with a pen and pencil. But what this book is doing differently is it focuses on how you bring that math and land on a piece of function, a piece of software that the software can run in real world. Um, whether if it's coded from scratch or whether if it's calling upon the library or building based on another library, this book covers all of that. So think about what could go wrong, right? So think about what is the difference. When you are writing an equation using a pen and a paper, do you care about the data structure? No. Do you care about data type? No. Do you care about how the software runs and whether if it fails? No. Do you care about bug check? No. Because using a pen and paper, you write a matrix and you do the algebra and your brain power is focused on the algebra itself. The rules of the data type are hidden because on a pen and pencil, you and I assume that the rules are the same. Now, that is not the same with computers. If a number is a float or if a number is an integer, they are two different data types. Same thing, if you run a for loop on a range of numbers or if you run a for loop on the list, then there's a slight difference. It's up to you, the software engineer, to determine what that difference is. And what are the pros and what are the cons? Are you really thinking about all of that when you're taking derivative of a function by using pen and paper? No, you do not think about that. So that is fundamentally the difference, which I really appreciate, right? Because when I was learning calculus, I didn't have a computer. I simply used pen and paper. And I feel like I missed out on a lot of things. And when I come in terms of doing computer science, and by the way, I do a lot of computer science, I realized Oh crap, I have to learn that from scratch. So number one thing that I want to say about this book is all that frustration, all that gap, all that blank you felt after doing a calculus exam, I felt all that. And I sincerely can tell you this book will fill in that gap for you. And then on top of that, of course, I'm not going to bore you with the details. This book covers a wide range of topics, right? It's not just calculus or derivative. It's so much more than that. We're talking about trees, networks. We're talking about randomness, probabilities. And then we're talking about geometric problems. We're talking about optimization problems. All of these things that when we build a TensorFlow neural network model and when we're taking for granted, this book covered the basis of all of that. So that is number two tip I want to share with you guys after I read this title, which is this wide range of topics a whole portfolio of context that this author is sharing with you with Python code and how that's going to affect my neural network model and the impact that the math is having with the final outcome. What is the consequence? What is the gotcha scenarios, right? That's amazing. I want to know that. So with that being said, with the final time left in this episode, I'm going to share with you guys a small example of what I learned from this book, which is this great function. Now, if you haven't taken calculus yet, what the gray function is doing is simply taking derivative of another function. So every function has an input, and whatever that input is doing, you can take a look at how this function's value changes with respect to the change of that input. And that is basically the fundamental idea of taking the derivative of a function. And we'll give a cute name, right? Gradient. So first things first, I'm going to load up a couple of libraries. So the NumPy package and the Matplot package are the basic packages that people use when they do Python. The JAX library, however, is this new library that I got to know of when I'm reading this title. Of course, you might have heard this library from elsewhere, but this book did a great job at explaining that. So I'm going to use this JAX library to do this small simulation and show you what we can do to use JAX library to implement some basic derivative and visualize what that looks like. 
So for example, I can use Jax and call the NumPy library, and then I'm going to call a sign function. I can throw in a number called 0, and obviously that gives me some output, right? Sign of 0 is 0, and that's what the output is. And this is a weird data type from the Jax library called device array. It's the Jax version of a NumPy array. And now I want to use this function to create a sign function from, let's say, minus 10 to 10. And that's going to be the range I'm using. And that sign of x is going to output function. And let's take a look what that looks like. So if I run this function, you're going to see that I use a small for loop in this list object. And then the for loop goes from minus 10 to positive 10 with step size 0 0.1. Of course, I haven't taken care of the data type, right? Because the data type is still this weird device array thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the data type by converting it into a NumPy array and get the number out so that it's just a list of numbers. So I'm going to throw that in a NumPy array, and then I'm going to flatten it by using this reshape minus 1 function, and then I'm going to call bracket 0 to get the numbers out. So that this way, it gives me a list of numbers, and I can get rid of that weird device array thing inside of that list. And now I'm going to plot this x, and as you can see, now this is your usual sine function, right? What that means is if it's a 0, then sine 0 is a 0, and then on top of that, it's a cyclical function. So what that means is it goes down, up, down, up, and continues like that forever. And then there's, of course, an upper bound and a lower bound. Upper bound is bounded by 1, and the lower bound is bounded by minus 1. Those are the nature of the sine function and how it's defined. And then I can take a look at the gradient of sine, which is the derivative of sine. Now, of course, that gives you cosine. So let's write that out. Suppose the function is sine of x, then the derivative of sine of x will be cosine x, which then again, it's still cyclical, but let's take a look at how that function looks like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same code, copy paste down here, and then I'm going to use this great function from the Jax library and throw the sine function in there. And then I'm going to use the same plotting library to plot it out. And voila, this way I can have one plot with two lines, one line being sine and the other one being cosine. And I can even give a legend so that the name corresponds to the color type of these lines. And there you go. And now you have a direct visualization of what these two functions look like. Whereas in the old days, you have to take a derivative versus now you can use this gray function and throw inside of another function so that the Gray function will take the derivative for you. And that makes your life easier. You don't have to manually work out the math formula to be able to do that. Now, that being said, you might be confused. Hey, this is the sine function from the JAX library. What if I want to define an arbitrary function and do whatever I want? And the answer is, of course, yes, you can do whatever you want. So let's take a look at another example. Suppose I create a function f of x that is x squared, then the derivative of this function will then be d f of x with respect to dx, and that will give you the answer 2x. That is the derivative if you were to do it on a piece of paper. So what that means is if you were to draw a tangent line on each dot of x squared and you trace it from left to right, the line will, of course, go from a negative number to a positive number. And nature of this function x squared dictates that the slope changes just like a straight line, 2x. So I'm teaching high school students these days, and some of them might have some difficulty visualize what that relationship look like. Not to worry. I can use the Jax library to take gradient of an x squared function to show students what these two plots look like. So here, I can use Jax library to define a function called x squared, and how I do that is basically input an x and take the multiplication, and that gives me x squared. And then I can also use the grade function to take the derivative. So of course, I have this second function called some random function derivative to indicate that this is now the derivative of the first function. So with that being said, now these two functionalities have been defined. Then I can use the same methodologies I used above to define two streams of data points and then I'm going to plot them side by side.
So this is the code that I use to create this plot. And boom, you can look at the results down here. You can see that there's two plots. The plot on top is the x squared, ranges from minus 10 to positive 10. And of course, the nature of x squared means that there's a minimum point in the center at zero. Because zero squared is zero by itself, and that's the minimum spot. All the other numbers you throw into the function, it will give you a positive number. And the derivative of x squared is 2x. How do I visualize that? Well, 2x is just a straight line, right? And you can plot that out on the plot, and that happens to be the second plot down here. And that makes our life easier because the second plot is also plotted from minus 10 to positive 10. And you can see that this derivative also goes to 0. And then on top of that, I can change the type of the line so that you can kind of see these numbers and what the coordinates they're crossing a little bit easier. And then if that's not clear, I can even show you at the particular point estimate what these results of the two functions look like. So for example, I can use this print statement here, printing out the results of these two functions by inputting some random x called sum x. I can simply define that as whatever number I want. In this case, let's define as 3. Then I can use this line of code to print out the results that's coming out of these two functions. The first function is f of x. Since that's x squared, then 3 squared, obviously, that's going to give me number 9. So that makes sense. The second one is a derivative of this function f with respect to x, and therefore I use df dx as my notation, and the result of that is obviously 2x, because 2x is a derivative of x squared. And since the formula is 2x, and the x is 3, the 2 times 3 is going to be 6, therefore this number here is number 6. So that also makes sense. So that is going to be a numerical example to show you what that derivative is, if your function is x squared, and if that derivative is 2x. So with that being said, that's the end of this video. Hopefully it gives you ample amount of information to help you to make a judgment of how this book can be helpful for you. I know it helped me a lot. I hope you guys like the content. If you do enjoy the video, give a like and subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next episode.